But we're very happy to have you here for this colloquy. And this is a special one also because this is the colloquy in which we transition to Grand Valley State University sponsorship. But before we get into that, I just want to remind you of our outstanding speakers. We have Mildred Solomon, the president and CEO of the Hastings Center and professor of anesthesiology and medical ethics at Harvard Medical School. Also, Frederick Zimmerman, who is professor and chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at UCLA. At the suggestion of our speakers, this is the first time that the colloquy is being simulcasted to other locations, in particular the locations where they're from, the Hastings Center, Harvard Medical School, and the Fielding School of Public Health. So this is an exciting new development for us that we're, we're simulcasting. Who knows, maybe it's the world next year. <laughs> so thank you to our speakers for making this possible and for suggesting it and for cooperating and making this happen. Our moderator this evening is the Reverend Jewel Medenblick, the president of Calvin Theological Seminary, and he will be responsible for for the moderating of the discussion. And of course, our sponsor again is the Richard and Helen DeVos Foundation. But at this point, I wanna introduce Dr. Jean Nagelkirk, who is our Vice Provost for Health at Grand Valley State University, and represents the transition of Grand Valley taking on further responsibility for this colloquy. So Jean, please join us. Thank you, Doug. Um, well, good evening and welcome to this ethics series. We're excited you're all here. And in fact, in the overflow room, we have two classes of students. So we're really excited for that as well, as well as our webcasting. Um, the title of the talk today is Ethics of Resource Allocation Across the Lifespan. And we are so pleased that we're able to host the ethics series and continue it for the community. But my real job here today is to introduce our president, the president of Grand Valley State University, Tom Haas. He's here today. President Haas has a distinguished career in higher education. And during his time at Grand Valley, there has been a steady rise in enrollment to a record-breaking 25,325 students, of which approximately one-third of them are health-related students in one of our 74 health-related programs. So we're proud of uh, the accomplishments we have in health under Dr. Tahas. With his support, we have 32 new majors have been established and nine graduate programs. President Haas is very active in our community and serves on a number of national boards in higher education. And in his free time, because we know he has a lot of it, he is a wonderful mentor to our students, faculty, and staff, as well as an exceptional leader in higher education innovation. Please help me welcome Dr. Haas. even better good uh, they uh, they're smart there's food over there and they even said thank you for the cheese so that's good well again thank you and uh, welcome everyone to, to this uh, colloquy and we are thrilled to uh, be able to host this in, in transition and um, unfortunate Luis uh, is unable to be with us but I know that uh, uh, he would be thrilled absolutely thrilled to see this turnout uh, uh, for this particular discussion and this discussion is, is very relevant and I think uh, very much uh, attuned with, with our mission. And our mission is, is clear in that uh, Grand Valley is uh, shaping students' lives, uh, their professions, and our society. And this particular colloquy hits on each one of those uh, particular areas of responsibility that we have to those students that are choosing us at the graduate and the undergraduate level. And then, of course, it uh, plays nicely in terms of how we interact with our community. And this is a way, really, to uh, uh, take the vision of Rich and Helen and uh, uh, bring this out to the community. They, they know that the university here has to be part of it and has to be uh, integral 
in what we are sharing with each other. And our community is making us a very special place. Uh, those uh, 25,000 plus students uh, are attracted here and they can go pretty much any place. They're very talented. And we're thrilled that they're choosing he us here at Grand Valley and in many regards, staying right here in West Michigan and in, in the state as well. We celebrated 100,000 alums in April. And of those 100,000 alums, 43,000 are still just in the Tri-County region of Kent, Ottawa, and Muskegon counties. So they are staying right here. And they're getting good jobs, good professions, many of them in the health-related fields. And Gene mentioned uh, the investments that we're making in, in this particular space, and I'm thrilled that we are doing just that. It's strategic for us, because I do know that if we go back to the early start of the university with Bill Seaman, he had, with the others that are founders, uh, said we need to keep the talent here. Well, we have to develop that talent, and that's what we're doing in all the types of programs, and in particular, this, this space in, in uh, health, health professions and in nursing. So thank you again, uh, again for coming. Um, let's see, yeah, just, I'd rather not talk about notes, but, okay. You know, I did everything, no. <laughs> uh, but um, let me just uh, uh, finish it off uh, this way. Um, if you uh, look at the uh, current literature, uh, whether it be a, a news article and the like, uh, and it comes to health, there's always questions about what to do and for the right reasons. And I think this particular series is just going to help us identify what those questions are, what should, and therefore what kinds of answers we need to discuss. And many times there's going to be conflict. Many times you're going to have to look at that common ground that uh, will, uh, will go forward. And there's going to be disagreements. But I do think that the whole notion of, of ethic comes through loud and clear in the health professions and nursing because we need to trust those that are providing for our health. And I'm hopeful that this particular series will in uh, really uh, bring that to the forefront, that we are trusting those that are doing the research, trusting those that are uh, delivering the services that we want, trusting those that are in the uh, big pharma and, and others in the, in the uh, uh, pharmacology area, and, and, and those that are teaching our students and the future PTs and PAs and the medical docs and the speech language pathologists and you name them, that's a team. And here at Grand Valley, we, we are part of that uh, connection with that future, with that future state as we look ahead and the, and the complexities in this whole area of healthcare. So I am thrilled again to welcome you here to the university, welcome you here to this colloquy. So enjoy the evening and uh, we'll get on with some of those questions and uh, thoughts and perspectives by our guests here. Thank you very much. I just realized I didn't tell you who I was. I know a lot of you, but I'm Doug Kinchy. I was dean at Grand Valley for 28 years when a lot of that growth took, period, <coughs> took place. And I'm now a professor and also recently, uh, last five years, been the director of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. So I'm pleased again to, to welcome you. Dr. Tomatis wanted <coughs> me to make sure that you are aware that there are cards in your packets. The first part of the Q&A will be based on questions that you write out and send to the side of the aisles and we have people picking up those questions. And then the last part of the Q&A will be verbally and we'll have mics available for that. Also, there is a white evaluation sheet. They want to make sure that you please fill that out and leave it, at, leave it there as you leave. And if you're here getting CME credit, there should be a green evaluation form that you should have your name. If you haven't picked one up, be sure to get that. That's required for your CME credit. At this point, it's my pleasure <coughs> to introduce uh, our moderator for this evening, and that is Reverend Jewel Maidenblick, who is the president of Calvin Theological Seminary. Jewel? Thanks, Doug. Uh, I know that he'll want to make sure that uh, we're all doing our, our duties, Dr. Tomatis, and so to him, congratulations again on the 22nd coll colloquy. As noted, I am uh, an ordained pastor, president of Calvin Theological Seminary, but I'm also a retired lawyer. My uh, practice as an attorney was primarily in the area of insurance defense. 
I met someone in the medical field who said, so you were a part of the dark side, weren't you? <laughs> so I hope that uh, tonight you'll forgive me for any past discretions, but I step into this setting with that appropriate fear and trembling. I know that many lawyers think that they are doctors, but I also know many doctors who think they are lawyers. But my role tonight is to be neither lawyer or doctor, but a guide for the presentations and a conversation that will follow. Just this past weekend, I was with my father to celebrate his 80th birthday. Part of celebrating up this time with him and my mother had to do with just checking with him about his physical well-being. Just a few years ago, he underwent heart bypass surgery, quintuple heart bypass surgery. I'm grateful for the care he received and the health he currently displays. At the same time, tonight's topic is to move us from thinking of any one age group or portion of a lifespan to again thinking about the ethics of resource allocation across the lifespan. Now tonight as you have the opportunity, there is a schedule that's there, but uh, you remember when you were in school, they started with A and they ended with Z. We're doing something different. We're gonna start with Z tonight. And so uh, Dr. Frederick Zimmerman is gonna be our first speaker. We're grateful for this economist who is concerned about the ethics of public health policy and as already noted he's professor and chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at UCLA and he'll address us first and so would you give a warm welcome to Dr. Zimmerman. received and uh, I'm looking forward to a very interesting conversation about these important topics and um, so I wanted to start actually by um, acknowledging the support of the DeVos Foundation and thanking them for that I think this is a really important conversation that we're having that we're initiating here this evening so uh, I appreciate the DeVos's commitment to this issue in this area over a period of many years, and it sounds like it will extend into the future. And it's very appropriate. It, over the course of my talk, I'll be saying a bit more about why I think conversations like this, in fact, are so important. Uh, and I also appreciate uh, the presence of all of you here and all of the students who are behind me and yet also out there. Um, so uh, this is a talk about um, economics and ethics and resource allocation. I'm going to start with uh, the story of this woman. Uh, her name is Soon Ja Kim. She's a Korean immigrant to the United States. She's an undocumented immigrant. Uh, and this is a story that I learned about in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, a couple of years ago. Very interesting story. She came to this country uh, with her daughter, who is a, was a legal immigrant to the United States, and her granddaughter. Uh, so, so there are three generations here. Um, and Sunja, this woman, the grandmother, uh, overstayed her visa so that she could help her daughter when her granddaughter was born. Uh, and she ended up staying for quite a long time because the the mother in this story uh, got divorced and the father uh, left the scene and, and was no longer part of the family. So for many years there were three generations living uh, together and it worked very well until the grandmother started to get sick. Uh, she had extensive osteoarthritis um, and she was unable to care for herself. So her daughter, the middle generation, was taking care of her. But this became increasingly burdensome for her. The, middle, the, the woman, in the, the mother, her daughter, um, was named Mi Cha. And Mi Cha worked in a grocery store and had very limited English and not very high wages. Uh, so she was taking care of her mother at the same time she was taking care of the daughter. The daughter eventually did uh, get old enough and became quite a successful uh, young woman. But when she was in high school, um, the grandmother's problems became very acute, uh, so much so that she required round-the-clock care. And the burden of this care really fell to uh, the mother in this family. 
Um, and the mother then uh, got sick and was hospitalized. So one year, uh, I think it was her, high, her senior year of high school, the, the, the granddaughter in this family, came home from school to find her mother collapsed on the floor. And she knew enough to take her mother to the emergency room. She thought it would just be a few days, but the mother was admitted to the hospital and ended up spending two weeks there. So now this high school student was, had the sole charge of her ailing and very frail grandmother. Uh, so she took her to a local hospital um, because the, the middle generation, the daughter, could no longer care for her. So Sunja, this woman, um, was discharged after four days in the hospital. She was diagnosed with um, extensive osteoarthritis, a few other relatively minor problems. She had acute pain. She was unable to walk. She was unable to care for herself, but she was stabilized by the hospital. Now, the family had no means to pay for her, and this woman, Sunja, being an undocumented immigrant, uh, was, did not qualify for any government-sponsored care. But we have a law in this country called EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment uh, and Active Labor Act, which says that a hospital may not turn away someone who needs uh, life supporting care. Okay, so if there's a life-threatening emergency, the hospital cannot turn that person away just because they can't, the person can't pay for it. So the hospital did admit her and treated her for free. And, and as I say, after four days, she was stabilized and could be discharged. The problem is that there was no place safe to discharge her to. The mother was still in the hospital also. And this high school senior was not able to, to care for her. They had uh, very few other relatives and no close relatives. As I say, the, the father in the scene had, had split the scene. Uh, so she ended up spending 80 days in the hospital. There was simply no other pl safe place for her to go. And over the course of these 80 days in the hospital, she racked up $103,000 in costs. Now, those of you who know anything about medical economics know that there's a difference between costs and charges. These were not the charges. These were the actual costs to the hospital. So, and so in some sense, the, um, the cost to society in terms of the resources that were used in the care of this woman. Okay, the actual charges were over $400,000. Uh, but this was the true cost. So um, I think this is a very interesting place to start when we think about resource allocation in medical care. Um, Sunja, this woman, the Korean grandmother, her needs really were not met in the hospital. Uh, she was stabilized, but really what she needed was longer term uh, rehabilitative care, perhaps, for example, in a skilled nursing facility or someplace like that. Uh, and part of what she, that's what she needed medically. But what she really wanted was interaction with other people. She didn't, she had very limited English, so she especially wanted people to speak with her in Korean. Now, the nurse staff in the hospital did the very best they could. Of course, they had very few Korean-speaking nurses or interpreters available. So most of this was in English. It was a kind of pidgin English between Sunja and the whatever nursing staff could, could find the time to interact with her. But this wasn't their job. They had other jobs that they needed to do. And those of you who are familiar with busy hospitals know that nurses are often really quite busy with patients who have very immediate needs. So this was not their job, and they, they did as best as they could, but it wasn't quite enough. Um, so Sunja's needs really were not being met, either her uh, sort of longer-term care needs or her kind of psychosocial needs for interaction and support. The hospital, by the way, was about 40 miles away from where these people lived. Uh, so it wasn't that easy for the rest of the family to get there, even after the mother was discharged. Um, and so I use this as an example, this story, to ask or to say that ethics is not really about what we should do, it's about what we want to do. And so as a society, we should be thinking about what it is that we want for people like Sunja. We have said that we want to make sure that she doesn't die on the doorstep of a hospital. And that's a really good starting place, but that should not be the ending place. When we talk about ethics in a hospital situation, now, you, you are all very sophisticated having participated in many of these talks before. I know that you understand that ethics is a very deep subject. 
Uh, but when I teach uh, a class in ethics in um, the School of Public Health at UCLA, which I do, um, I have people who haven't been exposed to ethics and they think that ethics is about what you should do and should not do. And so I like to clarify that it's actually about what we as a society want to do. It's about setting the rules of the road in a way that we're all sort of comfortable with what happens. And I would argue that what happened with Sunjab was actually not what we want. We don't want to spend an enormous amount of money caring for people in inappropriate ways that in the end doesn't make them any better off. The care for Sunja in an appropriate facility for someone in her position would have been about one-fourth or perhaps even a bit less of what, she, what the hospital cost was. So in other words, she could have spent an entire year in some kind of a rehabilitation facility for the cost of what she spent just about three months uh, in, in the hospital. Okay, she would have been much better off. She would have had people to interact with. Her, it would have been closer to her family. Uh, and she would have gotten the care she needed. So in this case, I think there was an ethical failure. And the ethical failure was that we didn't provide what she needed. So I'm gonna come back to that ethical failure and talk about where it comes from. But before I get there, I wanna talk about this. Some of you may recognize this. It's a Ouija board, all right? And it's a really fun game when you're you know, 10 or 12 years old, or maybe even a bit older, a bit younger. And the idea is that you get a bunch of friends together and this little uh, thing that's in the upper left corner is a, is a little kind of, uh, I'm not sure what you call it, it's, a, it's almost like a really tiny miniature table and you all put your fingers on it, <coughs> each person puts one or two fingers, and then you've got three or four or five people around the Ouija board, all with a finger or two on that little marker. And then you sort of close your eyes and put on some spooky music or something like that, and in a few minutes the thing starts to move around by itself. And it will stop on a letter, and it will stop on another letter, and it spells out a word, and it's all very exciting. You can ask it questions, you know. Does grandma still remember us? Moves around, yes. Uh, so um, uh, it's a very exciting thing. And of course, you know, when you're young, you're tempted to take it seriously, but psychologists have analyzed this, and they found that there are unconscious movements that are, you know, driving this thing around the board. Okay, so one person, one of the actual physical people there, is driving it. But, but we have this idea that people together can reach answers without necessarily talking about it. That's the idea of the Ouija board. That, we, that they can come to some sort of truth without actually talking and interacting. And of course that's a fallacy. And it's what I call the Ouija fallacy. And it's particularly prominent in economics, which is my field. Uh, in economics, we say that it's the market that gives us answers about what we want. People can interact in a market, buy and sell, and that somehow out of that process, we get to a solution about what we want. And this is, there's a formal branch of economics called welfare economics that develops all kinds of fancy mathematical theories around this basic idea. But again, the notion that by people just interacting silently without speaking to each other can somehow arrive at a good idea of what they collectively want is, I think, a fallacy. And when we talk about the market finding that solution for us, it's a, it's a fallacy within the market or a way of thinking about economics. Okay, so here's an example that has to do with the economics of healthcare. And I'm sure you've seen either this slide or something very similar before. Let's see if this is a pointer. Okay. So you can't tell which country is which very easily here, but what you can tell is that the United States has healthcare costs that are rising and are now a much higher percentage of GDP than any other developed country in the world. Uh, so, um, and you can see that it's, a bit, it's about double, you know, roughly double in the United States as what it is in most other countries as a percent of our economy. Uh, don't forget that our economy is also tremendously rich. It's much richer than these places like uh, Italy or Poland or Mexico, okay? So in dollar terms, we're spending even more per person. But this is just in terms of uh, the size of the economy. Okay, so um, uh, many people, uh, especially health economists and others, are questioning whether this is what we really want. So one way uh, to think about this is through the lens of inefficiency. So inefficiency is using resources in ways that make nobody better off, okay? So that's kind of a standard economic definition that 
you know, I think is useful to have in the backs of our minds. Um, so the question for healthcare is what's the right level of healthcare? If uh, inefficiency is using resources in ways that make nobody better off, uh, do, are there examples of inefficient spending in the healthcare industry? And this graph is a place to start. It doesn't tell us everything because it doesn't get us to a common shared value that we can all necessarily endorse, but I think it's a very good <laughs> point, excuse me, uh, and that is um, life expectancy. This is something that we would all endorse as a good. It's not the only component of health. It's not the only metric that we should be looking at, but it's a decent starting point. And on this decent starting point, the United States does very poorly. Uh, it does much poorly than the, uh, more poorly than the countries of Western Europe, Canada, and Australia. And again, here you see that we're spending much more of our GDP on health. So we're spending a lot, we're not getting much for it. Uh, the Institute of Medicine, which has now been renamed the National Academy of Medicine, uh, issued this report uh, in 2011. Uh, they identified $750 billion of waste every year in, the, in medical spending. Uh, a report came out a couple years later that su suggested it was more like $950 billion, but you know, what's a couple hundred billion dollars between friends, right? Um, so that's an enormous amount of money, and here you can see the breakdown that they, uh, that they arrived at, unnecessary services, 210 billion, fraud, 75 billion, inefficiently delivered services, 130 billion, excessive administrative costs, 190, prices that are too high, 105 billion, and missed prevention opportunities, 55 billion. These are big numbers. These are very, very big numbers. Um, you could quibble with some of this, but even if it's off by 10%, even if it's off by 50%. Even if it's off by 90%, $75 billion is still a heck of a lot of money to our economy. Um, and that accounts, by the way, for roughly 25% of all medical spending. Okay? So this is not an efficient industry from an economic perspective. Uh, and that's important because um, this is what economists call a production possibilities <coughs> frontier. Now, please don't worry, there won't be a test on this. This is not an economics class. Um, if you're familiar with this graph and you appreciate what it can say, great. If it's gibberish to you, don't worry. Uh, it doesn't matter. The point, though, is that uh, our economy can produce units of education or it can produce units of health. Uh, but it can't produce both. We have finite resources. And so this, this graph, which of course is completely notional, the numbers don't mean anything, suggests that you know as we um, move farther out in terms of health, we have to get fewer and fewer units of education, however defined. So I want to draw your attention to two things very quickly. One is that what's on, what we care about is health. We don't really care about health care. These are two different things. Health is not health care. Okay? So we should think about health being on this axis and not health care. The other thing is that the health care that we are providing is at an interior place. What that means is that by choosing to have the same amount of health, we could have a lot more education if we were being more efficient. Or if we wanted to choose the same amount of education, we could achieve a lot more health if we were being uh, efficient. Or we could, of course, get more of both of them. So this is a situation in which we could actually have more of everything just by be becoming more efficient. So economists think about trade-offs. And uh, so here are some of the things that we're trading off. Um, medical spending is truly crowding out some of these things that we might think of as valuable. So if we take that $750 billion and we divide it up, just as in a sense of the magnitude, you could give everyone in the United States about $1,000 for every person, a little over $1,000 for every man, woman, and child in the country, okay? Just in their pocket, right off the top. That's every year. Okay, that's a, that's a big, we call this the health dividend. That's a big chunk of change in your pocket. Uh, what was it, four years ago, there was a debt reduction committee, a super committee, composed of six Democrats and six Republicans. They tried to find consensus on how to reduce the debt, and they failed. They were looking, they were trying to reduce the public debt, or the deficit by $168 billion at the federal level. So let's say we could take that chunk out. Now, the reason we made this dividing line here, this is 55% to the private, 
45% to the public because that's how our medical care spending is divided up. About 45% is paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, and other government provided uh, uh, reimbursement for health uh, expenditures, and the rest is uh, private payers. So take that 168 billion, that's deficit reduction, and the rest would um, fund things like um, class size reduction in elementary school, universal preschool, food assistance, career training, social development, transportation, and so on. Okay, that's a big list of things that we could, we could get if we could somehow figure out how to reduce our healthcare spending. So healthcare uh, crowds out other expenditures in California. This is some work that I'm doing with some colleagues currently. Um, so this is very preliminary, but, um, but we looked at uh, budget years from 1990 to the current budget year. This is in the state of California again. And California is an interesting case because of Prop 13. Uh, makes it very difficult to raise taxes. So we're truly looking at a cap overall on spending. Uh, and what you can see is that, um, well, first of all, the other part of the context is that, in fact, uh, California has a statutory requirement to spend a certain amount on, on K through 12 education. Um, so I didn't think K through 12 education would be crowded out, but it is. Uh, so what this represents is, I'm sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not clear this graph, but for every dollar that's spent on uh, health care, in 1990, two and a half dollars were spent on education and two and a half dollars are spent on social and, and um, public health. This says healthcare, but it should say public health. Um, by the current year, for every dollar spent on healthcare, there was only a dollar spent on, on uh, social services and uh, public health. And there were two dollars spent on education and healthcare. So even education had declined relative to spending on healthcare. So again, inefficiency is resources that make nobody better off, and using resources inefficiently has a true cost. Okay, so these are some of the true costs. Now, when we think about the trade-offs in healthcare, and um, to think about the ethics of that, we have to think about how we want to consider the trade-offs that we make. So one kind of a trade-off would be some treatments versus other treatments. Okay, we could just, you know, there are different ways of treating conditions. Another would be some providers versus other providers. And another trade-off would be some patients versus other patients, okay? So this is within the universe now of healthcare. This is thinking about how can we make healthcare more efficient? We have to do trade-offs. Here are some of the trade-offs we could make. So examples are, this is a treatment for uh, macular degeneration and um, macular edema for, among people with diabetes. Uh, these are two drugs that both are effective at preventing and uh, reversing blindness in these two conditions. Um, and, but the thing is that one drug costs 40 times what the other drug costs. Okay, so bevacizumab costs about 1 40th uh, per dose as the cost of ranibizumab, and they are equally effective. Okay, and the side effect profile is very similar. Studies haven't been done to identify any significant difference in the risk profiles. Okay, so that's an example where we could have a treatment we, we could have a trade-off between those two kinds of treatments and get people to use the cheaper treatment. It would save a ton of money. One estimate says that over 10 years it would save $18 billion. Just that, just this one change would save $18 billion over 10 years, okay? So that's an example of trading off treatments versus other treatments. We could trade off providers versus other providers. We could use, um, uh, for certain procedures, we could choose to use uh, anesthesiologist MDs or registered nurse anesthesiologists. Okay, again, that would be trading off one type of provider versus another type of provider offering very similar services. What w the other thing we could do is we could choose to trade off some patients versus other patients. And we could say, um, well, we're gonna cover some patients using this extremely expensive system and then say, but there's not enough money left over to treat other patients. That's historically what we've done. So the unemployed, for example, have fallen through the cracks. Uh, now, of course, if you're over 65, there's a, there's a program for you. If you're uh, indigent, there's a program for you, which varies state by state. And in some cases, uh, it's um, extremely ungenerous. Uh, but that's a trade-off that we could make. Um, so Britain has something called the National Institute for Clinical Effectiveness that evaluates the relative value, effectiveness, of different kinds of treatment. They make that, they've decided to make that uh, trade-off. Germany um, has a system in which they say, um, 
if, you, if there's a market in which we already have enough anesthesiologists, a new anesthesiologist can't come in. If a market has enough dermatologists, if there are enough dermatologists already, let's say, in Munich, and you're a dermatologist, you want to start practice, sorry, you can't go to Munich. You have to go to Stuttgart or Bremen or someplace else. Okay? So they trade off the rights, as it were, of some providers versus other providers. Uh, and of course, uh, that was the Hungarian flag very briefly because Hungary does that as well. They trade off um, uh, people versus other people. And so here's an example of that. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Medicaid expansions under Obamacare. Um, this is a recent data. Um, the states that are in orange are not adopting the Medicaid expansions, meaning that there is going to be a ton of people who are without uh, primary care services uh, in those states. So we're still continuing to say we can't afford to cover everyone. And just this is um, a recent graph again. Um, among the states that are not expanding Medicare, you've got about 15%, 14% who are still uninsured of adults. And then in the states that are expanding Medicare, it's 7.5%. You're never going to get to 100% because some people are absolutely going to refuse for religious or personal reasons. And then the undocumented are not covered under Obamacare either. Uh, but still, these states are getting you know, fairly close if they're expanding Medicaid. Okay, so there are ethical problems with the approach of pitting patients versus patients. First of all, we get the punishment wrong. Like for example, um, we under the ACA, we can insurance companies are allowed to charge smokers <coughs> more, but in fact, there have been economic studies that say that the tax that smokers pay on cigarettes more than covers the cost of their care. Okay, the opposite is true for alcohol. The tax on alcohol is not enough to cover the additional medical costs caused by alcohol, but the tax on cigarettes is more than enough to cover the additional healthcare costs of smoking. Um, so we gang up on the people who seem the weakest. Um, it quickly becomes a contest of the powerful versus the weak. Seniors always have very strong political power in Washington and in states. Low-income people have very little. So th it's the, uh, it's the health care of seniors that tends to drive the conversation. And at the end, what happens is only a small minority is actually served very well in this system. And of course, many needlessly suffer. Okay. Um, so institutionally, uh, medical compensation is controlled by a committee, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm ru running a little low on time, so I'm not going to go over this, but I can talk about it more uh, in the, um, the Q&A if people are interested. But it's a committee that sets c compensation for specialty physicians and for uh, primary care physicians, and it's overwhelmingly uh, staffed by specialty physicians. So not surprisingly, specialty care is valued uh, in that scenario. So, um, and the same, something similar is true for drug use. Um, so a recent paper came out that said that, that found that, uh, that compared the price of drugs in the United States to the OECD average. Now the United States is a richer country than many of the other OECD <coughs> countries, so we would expect to pay more for our drugs. That's not so surprising. Uh, there are research costs associated with developing drugs, and the rich countries should probably pay more because they're richer. But when you divide by GDP per capita, the ratio of the price of generic drugs is just exactly the same in the United States and in OECD countries. But when you look at drugs that are still on patent, it's two to one. The United States is paying double what, con what uh, consumers in other countries are paying. And part of the reason is, uh, for that is that in other countries, they bargain with the drug companies. In the United States, Congress has declared you must not negotiate with drug companies. And so as a result, we're paying twice as much as countries in uh, the OECD. Something similar is true for primary care. Again, dividing <coughs> compensation by the OECD, uh, sorry, by the GDP per capita. Primary ca physicians in the United States get earned just as much relative to the level of GDP as primary care physicians in other countries. But specialty physicians make twice as much. And I should mention that everyone brings this up all the time. This is net of practice and training costs. Okay, so this is even after you subtract out the difference in training costs and practice costs, you get this enormous difference. And it's because of the institutions that we have that drive these disparities. So how do we reach agreement on a collective decision to limit people's consumption or their income? In other words, it's true that everyone's income, I mean, everyone's co every cost in medical care is somebody else's income. So when we talk about making medical care more efficient, we're also talking about reducing somebody's income or their consumption. Uh, healthcare is one example of this 
problem, but there are many others. Climate change is another, housing, schooling. There are lots of problems like this. So we need to figure out how to get there. And um, ethics gives us a vocabulary. And there are these five principles. Um, they have traditionally been defined at the individual level. So we've got autonomy, dignity, beneficence, justice, inclusivity. You could name some other principles of ethics, but these are five really important ones. They work differently at the collective level than they do at the individual level. So at the individual level, autonomy is about letting each person decide, but at the collective level, it's about ensuring that each person's values are represented in decisions that we make. We have to make some collective decisions. Autonomy doesn't mean abandoning the idea of collective decisions. We have to have a speed limit. That's a collective decision. Autonomy does not mean you let everyone drive as fast as they want whenever they want. Autonomy in the collective decision framework means uh, making sure that people's values are represented. Um, dignity means respecting individual decision making. Beneficence means arriving at a collective theory of value. That means that we have to all agree on what's good. Is healthcare the thing that we're driving for or is health the thing that we're driving for? And if health is the thing we're driving for, how do we define health? We need to do this collectively. Okay, justice, uh, we have the golden rule versus Rawls' original position, and I'm sure you know about that. Um, we need to think more, I think, about inclusivity. Who is it that we are including in the ethical tent? Whose interests should count? Should, uh, should the interests of undocumented people count in our conversation about covering uninsured people? Should they count or not? Okay, this is something that we need to reach a collective consensus on. Um, so thinking in terms of autonomy and the uh, importance of ensuring that each person's value are collected, we again have another Ouija fallacy. I think that we assign too much responsibility to the notion of democracy. Democracy will sort of solve all these problems. One person, one vote, and that's it. We no longer have to think about the rigor of autonomy in a collective uh, setting. But I think we need to think harder about autonomy. Uh, and I think we need to think harder about how to get everyone's voice heard in, as we make these important decisions. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the case of Sunja was represented an ethical lapse. It was not an ethical lapse on the part of the hospital who did a magnificent job, as far as I can tell from what I've read. It was not an ethical lapse on the part of the family. It was an ethical lapse in the policy context. The policy prescribed actions that were not in the best interest of this patient. And that's a, that's a policy failure. So we need to get past that. And I think the way to do that is to have structured dialogues in which we have conversations, much like this one, about uh, reaching some sort of consensus on these really big, important issues. Um, and I think that uh, having structured dialogue will enable us to preserve autonomy while limiting politics. Um, okay, there's more that I can say, but I'm out of time, and I think this is actually a really good segue to Dr. Solomon. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. We would want to make note right at this time that uh, remember you have a couple cards and maybe you want to actually think of writing one of those cards related to what you just saw in terms of a first presentation. And there are a couple cards as noted so you can write another one later and I'm sure because you're friendly people that you can once again share cards and have others or write them on a different piece of paper. We're getting uh, set for the next presentation that will once again have PowerPoint here. I do want to make note that both for Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Solomon, this is their first visit to Grand Rapids, Michigan. I know. The, all right. The fall colors were just for you and a few other people as well. All right. I think we're ready. So thank you, and Dr. Zimmerman. We now invite you to give a warm welcome, West Michigan welcome, to Dr. Solomon. Good evening, everybody. 
And it is really nice to be here in Grand Rapids. I'm delighted, and I chose my day very well. It's been gorgeous. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Dr. Tomatis, and I'm sorry that he can't be here. I'm sure I'm not as sorry as he is. Um, but it's been, it's been wonderful having correspondence with him in, pre in preparation for tonight. And the DeVos Colloquy, um, the committee of the DeVos Colloquy, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm honored and delighted to be sharing in this evening's events. And I'd like to start by reciprocating the hospitality, if I may, by inviting you to the Hastings Center. Um, we were founded in 1969, so we're celebrating our 46th year. Our mission is threefold, to do original scholarship in ethics, to support the field of bioethics itself, and to engage the public in conversations like the one we're having tonight. Um, we have a small staff in Garrison, New York, of eight scholars who do original research in bioethics, and 200 affiliated Hastings Center fellows from around the country, and increasingly from around the world, who are elected by their peers. Um, the way that we support the field is various, but uh, important things we do are publish two journals, the Hastings Center Report, which many of you may be familiar with, and a smaller journal called IRB, which focuses on the protection of human research participants. Uh, and then in terms of public engagement, we hold public events like this, and we use um, social media and the internet and a variety of other resources to make sure that the kinds of discourse that we're having tonight are not only among experts, but also um, based in the community with a lot of public participation. We're located an hour and a quarter north of New York City in the beautiful Hudson River Valley, so we do have color too. Um, and this is the view from our front lawn. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hate to tell people that it's actually the view from my office. Yeah. I'm a very lucky person. And we have a, an active visiting scholar program. So I'd like you to know that because I really do mean it when I say I'm extend, extending a reciprocal invitation. Um, you can apply to come and stay with us. We have an open door policy and we have many um, visitors who stay for a while. We also have day visitors. Now, it's just... Um, it's really wonderful to be able to follow on Dr. Zimmerman's presentation because we're going, uh, it's, I'm going to pick it up um, and try to talk about the cultural factors that s seem to be impeding our ability to have the structured dialogue that he calls for at the end of his talk. So that you'll see as this moves forward what it really is is a talk about our culture and what do we need to do to get to a place where we can be more open about the need to allocate wisely. I, but I want to start very simply with the simple fact that resource allocation happens. We just don't often realize it. There's widespread implicit priority setting. This arises both with regard to how we spend resources in the healthcare sector, um, where price is often used to determine who will receive what, or when a health system decides to build a new revenue generating technology rather than a primary care clinic for the indigent. These are implicit ways in which we are making decisions that haven't necessarily been talked about. But implicit priority setting also arises when we apportion our resources, our public dollars, across sectors. So um, resulting in differences in how we spend uh, for public health, for public infrastructure, like bridges and roads, for education, and for the environment. Unfortunately, both within healthcare and across these societal sectors, these allocations are rarely debated or mindfully considered. Within the healthcare se sector, our current de facto method is based on ability to pay and on market forces, so it creates unjust distributions of health goods. So there is, because of this unjust distribution, there's a fairness problem. But there's also what I'm going to call a wisdom problem, not too different than the inefficiency problem that an economist would talk about. But I've, I'm going to name it a wisdom problem, because I think we all have a common sense notion that there is a, wise, a better and a worse way to use our limited resources. Um, so we really have two problems. Um, but as I say, a large part of this is 
that this wisdom problem is invisible. We don't see the person who's been waiting too long to receive treatment or had to go forego medicines to pay the mortgage. Nor do we think about the impact on our children and grandchildren of leaving them with inadequate education, broken bridges, or a depleted natural environment. When resource allocation is invisible or its reality is denied, we lose the ability to make wise decisions. Let me just say that again and in, in writing. <laughs> right now, we sorely lack that kind of wisdom. We spend a huge proportion of our GDP on health care. But as Dr. Zimmerman points out, health care is only a small piece of what it takes to create health. President Obama's 2016 budget request for the National Institutes of Health is focused, and that of course is focused mainly on finding cures, is $31.3 billion. But the President's request for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is just a third of that, $11 billion. So surely we should spend more on prevention than we do now. But I would like to argue that we should do so not because spending on prevention saves money. Despite the rhetoric that one often hears, keeping people, people health, healthy longer doesn't always translate into reducing costs. Prevention can actually end up creating greater societal costs by extending life years because people who die early cost less. That, in certain circumstances, in certain ways. So rather, I would want to, I want to argue that we should invest in public health because it leads to less suffering and promotes hum human flourishing. So, we, so that's one way to think about it. And so to start with, I'm talking about what kind of judgments are we making about the allocation of our resources ver of cure versus prevention, that, that, that tension or that decision between those two. But we could also think about it in another way, in a straightforwardly human development perspective, focusing on the needs that we humans have at different points in our life cycle. So let, let, me, let me take a developmental perspective for just a moment. Let's start with the older population. Medicare is currently very generous when it comes to reimbursing for all manner of high technology interventions but it supports almost nothing when it comes to high touch. So we need to find ways to support frail elders in their home with logistical and social support so they can age in place. And even then, even if we're successful at that, um, there will come a time when many of us will still need more support, we'll have to leave our homes. And when that happens, I hope that we will find nursing homes that have modernized and can give the kind of dignified, respectful support that we would hope for ourselves. But unfortunately, right now, many of our parents and grandparents are institutionalized in nursing homes that strip people of their agency and are places of despair. So we know we're spending an awful lot on care for people near the end of life, but we aren't really investing in making the end of life experience better for ourselves, our parents, or our children. Now let's take the other end of the life cycle. We know that there are a few uh, key things that have proven very effective in promoting the development of children. There's strong evidence that home visits for pregnant teens and other high-risk pregnant women reduce premature births and therefore the disabilities that prematurity leads to. Once the baby is born, we could offer, imagine this, paid parental leave to reduce stress on working parents and to encourage the parent-child bonding, parent bonding. Paid leave is not a radical idea. It exists in most other developed countries. We could expand Head Start and universal pre-kindergarten for three, three and four-year-olds, creating lasting benefits. Now, in some cases, these programs might save money and even fuel the economy. For example, there's evidence that children who attend preschool are more likely to succeed academically, have higher lifetime earning potential, and, <coughs> and thereby spend more, they therefore have more money to spend, they fuel the economy, and they contribute more to taxes. These programs also help children develop the social skills they need for better, healthier interactions with others, 
So they are less likely to end up, for example, incarcerated, costing, which now costs taxpayers billions of dollars. But the main reason I think we should do these, again, is not to cut costs or to increase revenues. The main reason to support the healthy development of our children and the humane care of our elders through wise resource allocation is that we should want to be a society that promotes human flourishing. I'm arguing that we need to make allocation decisions that promote human flourishing across the life cycle. We should be a society with a strong ethic of care, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where we make commitments to one another and take up obligations to one another, both those living now and future generations. Future generations whose welfare can be hugely influenced by our actions and our inactions in health in education, in climate change, many other areas. So let me summarize what I've said so far. Resource allocation happens, and it happens all the time, but it often remains invisible, so we miss the chance to allocate wisely in ways that would promote human flourishing. I, I've tried to show that there's a lot that's unwise about the priorities that are implicitly occurring right now that do emerge from what is basically a closeted approach. So now let's take up the next, the next question. How, how, should we, how should we determine what is wise? I've given you some examples at both ends of the life cycle of what I personally think would be wise, but you know, this is a democracy, and I am sure that many reasonable people might have different ideas about what, how they would use our tax dollars. And um, so, one would hope that there are some principles that might help us guide this decision making. And in bioethics, there have been um, some principles. I'm going to just contrast two that are popularly discussed in the literature. One is to prioritize the sickest and the most vulnerable. This principle was one that the Swedish Parliament Priorities Commission relied on in its 1995 deliberations. Their approved budgets prioritized the sickest and offered treatments no matter how expensive nor how marginal the benefit. The trouble with that approach is that some of those who are sickest can't really, they're so sick that they can't benefit from maximal treatment. And that in those cases, using all the resources will reduce overall utility to the community as a whole, right? So rather than always focusing on rescue, which is another way of calling what I've got up on the wall, another, so an alternative to this principle of focusing on the sickness or, or rescuing the sickest, another approach is to think about maximizing total utility. This approach uses cost effectiveness data to determine how to get the most aggregate benefit from every dollar spent. It's an approach that the state of Oregon first used when they tried to allocate their Medicaid dollars. But there was trouble there too because it turned out that capping teeth <laughs> scored higher on cost effectiveness than did a life-saving surgery for appendicitis. Once they discovered this, the Oregon policymakers had to adjust their method and give some priority to the sickest. They couldn't just use total utility as measured by cost effectiveness. Norm Daniels and Jim Sabin have a wonderful book called Setting Limits Fairly. And in that volume, um, they summarized the, uh, the experiences in Sweden and the experiences in, by the Oregon Medicaid folks as this. Most people will neither sacrifice everything to the sickest nor abandon them completely. So wisdom probably means giving some priority to the sickest, but not all priority. Okay, but how far does that get us? That's pretty vague, right? It's very indeterminate advice. At, and at the end of the day, reasonable people are going to disagree. So we come back to how are we going to decide? Daniels and Sabin answer that question in this way. They direct us away from the belief that principles alone are going to help us. Instead, they've argued for establishing a fair process. Their focus includes attention both to distributive principles, how we're going to distribute, as I've just been sharing a few of those with you, but they've added a focus on procedural justice. 
Procedural ju justice would mean establishing a fair and transparent process for re reaching these decisions through a deliberative process. They argue not only for market accountability, which means that both the purchasers and the en enrollees would have access to performance data and options available in different plans, market accountability, but they also call for something um, they term accountability for reasonableness. Accountability for reasonableness envisions that health plans would develop policies on limit setting that meet at least four conditions. Publicly transparent so that all limit setting, no matter how it's done, whether it's explicit or implicit, should be knowable. With a relevant rationale that gives reasons for the decisions. And the reasons should be empirical data about effectiveness, but also reasons could be what principles you used. Did you use the pr principle of rescue or did you use the principle of maximum utility? What was, your pr what, were both your, what was both your evidence and your principles? That there would be opportunities for revision and appeal and continuous improvement and that we wouldn't just say we're gonna do this but that we would regulate ourselves through some kind of voluntary or public regulation. So this is in a very, very brief way, a kind of summary of some of the major ways that these issues have been discussed in the bioethics literature. And as good as Daniel's and Sabin account is, and I think it for uh, accountability for reasonableness, I think is a very good process, and m many other people also think it's very justified. All of this assumes that we have the social buy-in for using these principles and processes. But in the United States, we haven't even gotten to that point. We don't have social buy-in for resource allocation, overt resource allocation. And as a result, we don't have a single entity, a commission or an agency or an institute, we have no entity with the social legitimacy and authority to make these kind of allocation decisions. In fact, to me, all this talk about principles and fair process seems very academic, given that we live in a society that has given no entity the authority to use these principles or processes. In fact, as I say, we haven't reached social legitimacy and you could kind of, this will resonate with you as you think about conversations that you may hear at the water cooler or as you read the newspaper. The major kinds of ways we talk about this right now are, let's let the market decide. Ult uh, uh, you know, we act as though the market will speak for itself and ultimately it will create services that will reflect what people want. But we know very well that there are many people who have needs that are not being met. Um, another thing you hear is, well, if we just eliminate waste, I completely agree with what Dr. Zimmerman showed about the amount of waste there is and how we must address it. But even if we do a much better job with waste, we still should be having conversations about where do we deploy our resources to ensure the greatest amount of human flourishing. It won't solve our problem from needing to talk about what we value and what we want to do. And then we have another camp or another subset of our population that says we should assure access no matter what the cost because um, nothing is more important than um, health care. It's seen as so precious that everyone should have access no matter how expensive or how marginal the benefits. So these are very prominent cultural themes that have blocked us from really thinking harder about this. And it caused me to think about why. Why is it so hard to talk about allocation in the United States? What is it about our culture that makes this so difficult? And could we cultivate a more civil discourse about it? So like any hugely challenging issue, the American resistance to setting limits, I think, um, has many, many causes. I'm gonna just name three, and I'm gonna talk about two of the three. The first is what is unbridled faith in markets. And um, <coughs> since we have an economist here who can help in the questions and answers to say why this really can't be a perfect market, why healthcare can't and shouldn't be a market, at least I think that's what he'd say. I'm not sure, I don't wanna speak for you. 
Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that because I, I think that's something we can discuss in the, in the questions and answers. But I wanna talk about two other phenomenon in our culture that um, is, is in some ways less addressed. I'm gonna claim that we have a love-hate relationship with evidence, especially evidence about cost. And that we have valorized patient choice. And let me say what I mean about each of these things. First of all, about evidence, about cost. Um, I'm skipping in interest of time. Okay, since the release into the market of new technologies is the major driver of increasing costs, right? The major thing driving cost is the release of these new technologies. Both their comparative effectiveness about quality and impact and their cost effectiveness, both of those things would be, are deeply important because that is the major driver of costs. The UK, Germany, France, Canada, and other developed countries all have technology assessment organizations but it's been very hard to get any traction for technology assessment in the United States. In the US in the mid-1990s, physician specialty societies nearly closed down what was called the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, which was issuing evidence-based practice guidelines. It was kind of a nascent technology assessment effort. But um, when they came out with guidelines that said that certain forms of back surgery were of questionable effectiveness, they, were, they got a lot of pushback from a lot of back surgeons. Now, the Affordable Care Act attempted to remedy this situation by calling for the creation of an entity that would undertake comparative effectiveness research on a scale we had never had before. The hope was, as the ACA was being drafted, the hope was that we could begin to, uh, to set priorities on the basis of what works and what doesn't and where the greatest value is to be gained. However, during the process of the sausage making, as they say, of the, of the Affordable Care Act, comparative effectiveness was transformed into patient-centered outcomes research. The Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, was established. But it's char, and that was a success, and that's good. It passed, but at a cost. Its charge was reduced. It could only look at comparative effectiveness, that is, at comparing the effectiveness, the quality outcomes, but it not at cost. So today, PCORI funds $500 million worth of grants every year, but Congress has explicitly refused to allow PCORI to pay for the collection of any cost data in any of its funded studies. Congress has also specifically forbidden Medicare to take cost effectiveness research into account when setting reimbursements. Now, I, I know, and I'm sure people here will say, that cost effectiveness studies have their limitations. And they should, cost effectiveness as a methodology often needs to be modified, just as I explained ha happened with the Oregon study. But to ignore cost data is to willfully blind ourselves. I, you know, frankly, I think we have a very adolescent and highly individualistic attitude, I can have whatever I want, in which stewardship, community well-being, and intergenerational equity take a back seat. Now, evidence about cost isn't a panacea. It's never gonna show us exactly the right path. We can't determine what we want to do based just on cost data. There's gonna be value disagreements. Different people will weight the same values differently. But the old saw is really true. There can be no good ethics without good facts, and comparative effectiveness and cost data are both sources of good facts. Now, another thing that I think is promising is, promising is that thanks to the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, also thanks to PCORI, even with its limitations, and to the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, which has called upon health systems to become learning health systems, all of these things have finally begun to enable us to embrace comparative effectiveness research. I think we have turned a corner and we are doing a better job of that. But now we have to remove our blinders and insist upon um, collecting evidence about cost. Academic medical leaders, health services researchers, policymakers, and legislators need to insist on using data to create evidence about what brings the greatest value and then build and reimburse for that kind of care, eliminate, 
um, eliminating less desirable interventions. And I also think that this, while this has to be a conversation among healthcare leaders and po health policy makers and those outside of healthcare but in public health, um, we also need to efforts to educate the public so that they can come to understand that good stewardship is required and will benefit us all. And this part of the public piece is not going to be easy. because There are many instances of health interventions that bring marginal benefits, very modest benefits, but at extremely high cost, and people will want them. So that brings me to the next issue, that the overwhelming demand for interventions brings me to what are we going to do about our notions of patient choice, because we, many of us will want that marginally beneficial intervention. So let me say, I'm going to end a little, I have a few more minutes, and I'm, I want to try to explain what I mean by the valorization of patient choice. We live in an era when there is precious little in opportunity to introduce the concept of the common good. And when it is introduced, it's often sus suspect and regaled as un-American. In the policy arena, PCORI is again, unfortunately, an excellent case study. Not only has the collection of cost data been taken off of PCORI's remit, but the move away from comparative er effectiveness research to patient-centered outcomes has been a move that privileges patients' beliefs and preferences over everything else. Choice is a deeply held American value, and I'm not attacking it here. It reflects our commitments to liberty and to individualism. Maximizing choice allows people the opportunity for broader self-expression and the realization of personal preferences. It's often very deeply respectful, as when, for example, progressive nursing homes allow residents maximum choice over when they will rise or how they will dress or what they want to eat. So choice is a wonderful way to express respect for persons. But it's not an ethical principle in itself. It's one of several ways to stand up respect for persons, which is the principle. In our culture, we do tend to show respect by allowing people the freedom to choose. Um, but respect for persons deeply understood requires much more than just saying it's your choice. Deeply understood, a robust concept of respect for persons demands, in my view, insistence that we attend to people's needs and to fair equality of opportunity, not just to empty choices. If we truly respect persons, respect persons, children must have the opportunity to develop their human capacities and to develop and fulfill their life plans. Paradoxically, to be truly self-determining Children need to live within strong communities where they have opportunities for loving relationships, education, places to play safely in the out of doors, and healthy foods. There's a widespread false dichotomy in our nation between individualism and communitarianism. The healthy development and well being of individuals requires flourishing communities. We are interdependent. But so long as only patient-centered outcomes count, what will happen to community concerns? What will happen when patients choose marginally beneficial interventions, which are incredibly expensive and may not really bring that much benefit, but cause enormous opportunity loss somewhere else? In other words, how far should patient-centeredness go? In the clinical setting, perhaps some of you have experienced um, patients demanding antibiotics for viral, viral infections, and then you've wondered, oh my goodness, if I make this patient mad, is my, are they going to mark me down on that patient satisfaction survey that the hospital's gotta, got, 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 got them filling out? Um, you know, others of you may have experienced families insisting that everything be done for their dying loved one without realizing that everything may include deeply ineffective treatments or even burdensome and harmful ones. As healthcare leaders, many of you have had to face decisions about whether your formulary should include very expensive but only marginally effective drugs, like chemotherapeutic agents that may only extend life by a month or two but are exorbitantly expensive. 
The problematic face of patient choice is also evident in numerous health policy contexts. I'm just gonna give you one example. Right now, there are um, so-called right to try laws. How many of you have heard of, of these? They're in 17 states. 17 state legislatures have passed right to try laws. Um, these laws attempt, and I'm underscoring attempt because I really, thankfully, don't think they're gonna hold up in court, but they attempt to support patients' desires to access unproven drugs that are still in very early trials and very far from FDA approval. The language of these laws is very telling. It is rife with words like choice and liberty. Used in this context, in my view, words, wor when words are used in this kind of context, demanding things that for which we have no evidence, they reduce the deeply important concept of respect for persons into nonsensical support for meaningless choice. Choices, in fact, that are more likely to be harmful than beneficial to the people who want access to these unproven medicines. But it's not just their personal harm I'm worrying about. Um, meeting unbridled demands for unproven medicines would undermine our ability to establish evidence that's necessary for the well-being of the lives of everyone in the entire community and of future persons. So my conclusion is that unfortunately, in the United States and particularly in American healthcare, the concept of choice has been appropriated. It's moved from being an, a means of effectuating respect for persons uh, or means of enacting our freedom into a holy grail that stands to justify an avoidance of important truths and hard decisions. Its valoration, valorization, the valorization of choice, derives from the convergence of two very powerful cultural realities. Our strong individualism, on the one hand, makes us inclined to valorize choice, married with our consumer culture. A strident focus on individual rights, on the one hand, along with a naive belief in markets, and the view of patients as consumers, together valorizes choice. So my concluding wish is that we recalibrate. We should continue to protect choice and maximize individual discretion when that's appropriate, but arguments for maximizing choice should not be allowed to trump arguments for community well-being, stewardship, and intergenerational equity. And to end, I'm just going to summarize where I kind of, where I went on this talk, I hope that it was clear and that you, that this comports with your sense of what I'm, what, of the message I'm trying to bring. That our motivations um, should be for allocating resources widely, should not only be to save money, but also to promote human flourishing. That we should embrace both cost and outcome evidence. That won't solve our problem. We need to deliberate about our value differences because those are inherent and that's a good thing to talk about. And we should discuss those value differences transpa in transparent ways. But before we can do that, we have to create some social buy-in. There has to be a sense of legitimacy. And we don't have anything like the technology assessment organizations and other evidence collecting entities that exist in other developed countries. Absent um, absent those national entities, I think that in the United States, health systems themselves are going to play a major role. You can see this with the uh, emergence of accountable care organizations. You can see it with the push for learning health systems, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. I think it's going to fall on you. Um, so I would hope that healthcare leaders should spearhead cost and quality data collection and create your own processes for allocation decisions. And that if you do that, we can hopefully recalibrate the balance between personal choice and stewardship and cultivate public understanding of the value of stewardship. In these ways, I hope we can build a society that maximizes individual rights while preparing us to work together for the common good. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite you to, uh, both of you, Fred and Millie, to come forward and 
be ready. This is my privilege then to open up the conversation. We'll do so in two parts. The first is a question and answer session of nearly 40 minutes by use of the question cards that should be turned into volunteers. And the clearer you write, the more appreciative I will be. The second question and answer session is during the last 20 minutes or so where you can ask questions directly with the use of the two handheld mics on the side. And once again, you're invited to just raise your hand if you have cards or later on when you would like the mic. For both these sessions, I invite you to make your comments and questions as brief and as focused as possible in order to allow as many, um, many, as, can po many as possible to participate. So I know that we're going to get questions in just a little bit. And while we do so, um, Dr. Zimmerman, you heard a kind of a question was going to be directed to you from Dr. Solomon. Uh, she had the list of three and said that an unbridled faith in markets is one of those cultural items. Is healthcare a market? Well, healthcare is a market, um, but it's a highly imperfect market. Um, I think one of the interesting things about being a health economist is how few, how little impact we have on the political discourse in our country. I think there are very few health economists who would argue that um, health care is a good market uh, in the sense of uh, efficiently providing resource allocation decisions. Um, and that is true even for economists of a fairly conservative bent. Um, and yet, in the political discourse, we hear how the market is going to solve problems, and that's very frustrating for me and I think for most health economists. Um, you know, the hallmarks of a good market are good information, complete information, um, uh, predictability, you know, relatively low risk. Um, these are things that simply don't exist in the healthcare market. Standardized units. Um, so if you're selling a sack of potatoes, that's a great market. Okay, you know what you're going to get. You can measure the weight. Uh, you know, there's no uncertainty. Uh, healthcare is just not like that. Uh, and so, no, it's not a good market at all. All right, so uh, the questions are coming in. And once again, keep raising your hands and we'll try to do them. Some of you have directed uh, the question directly to an individual. And so I'll try to follow that as well. Uh, so Dr. Solomon, a couple, um, what, Wise and worse ways to solve our distribution problems. Do you have any suggestions on that, on a wise way to solve a distribution problem? I'm not quite sure I understand the question because I think all of this is a distribution. Everything we've been talking about is a distribution. I wonder if we could move your mic just briefly. Sorry. A wise way to solve our distribution problems are first to talk about them to recognize that we are making these decisions, but we're not making them, and to create ways to have deliberate, structured conversations, to use Dr. Zimmerman's term. There's no reason why this can't, it, absent a national conversation with national rec recommendations, which is the state of our country right now, there is no reason why health systems can't develop several committees that would look at choices about how they're going to use their resources inside their own institutions. There's an opportunity to do that now as accountable care organizations are structured. We flipped the incentive for fee-for-service, fee which incentivizes overuse, and we've sort of flipped that when health systems take on responsibility for a given population for a given sum of, of, of money per, per, per person. So where we once had incentives for over, we may now have incentives for underutilization, but at least we are no longer incentivizing over, overuse. And there's an opportunity there to make really careful um, overthinking about how we're, gonna how we're gonna meet the needs of that given population within those constraints. Another way to do that is learning health systems, which I mentioned at the very end of my talk. And again, that means deliberate conversations, learning about what's working and what's not working, and making conscious choices at the system <coughs> level through committees that could include clinicians, administrators, and very importantly, patients and community representatives. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a, um, not a pleasure to try to work through all these cards while you're talking, so forgive me for that. But uh, let's, let's try to get to at least a couple more together. Um, how can, we get, uh, you, um, how can we get away from patient satisfaction driving policies? 
seem to strike a chord. Yeah, you know, patient status, this is very non-politically correct, but I think very defensible and evidence-based that there are, there's a, a significant research that shows that patient satisfaction is a poor measure of actual quality. So for example, patients who don't know that pain really can be, relie be relieved often score their their pain, uh, their uh, experience in the hospital quite high, thinking that there was nothing that could have been done for their pain. So there, that's one place where we know that patient satisfaction is a very poor measure. Um, and there are, uh, there are other instances. Patients don't know what they don't know, and so they can score high, um, they can score institutions high when they shouldn't be. On the other hand, it can also drive in the opposite direction, that, y that it changes clinician behaviors where physicians especially may feel they don't have a leg to stand on to say no to unreasonable requests from patients, and they may feel pressure because they know that there's a kind of customer is always right culture that is being promulgated by these patient satisfaction surveys. How to solve that? You know, hospital leaders have to listen to the clinical experiences, and together I can't, just can't get away from the fact that this has to be discussed and that when clinicians who are on the front line of experiencing this um, should be supported by their administrators to at least have a conversation to figure out how we're going to do this. Unfortunately, in some of my experience in some health systems, there isn't a climate in which people feel they can come forward and question it. And I, I really think it should be. Thank you. Dr. Zimmerman, we're going to turn to you for a couple of these as they were noted for you. Uh, will a single-payer system be more appropriate in resource allocation? Will a single-payer system help eliminate waste? And is our political governmental system a barrier to moving to a single-payer system? So, uh, I mean, we'll just give it to all of you. So, single-payer sure. system. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I don't think a single-payer system is very realistic. It was um, in this country politically at this juncture. You know, it was certainly on the table very early on. Uh, in the lead up to the ACA, and then it was taken off the table very quickly as being an, just a non-starter. Um, and I think it's probably going to be like that for, for many, many years. So I don't think politically it's feasible. Um, I, don't, I don't know that a single payer system would solve all the problems that we, that we would like it to solve. Uh, I think it, it's an interesting model that would at least have the potential of fixing some of the problems of a very fragmented uh, system that we have now. Um, but it's, it's not the panacea that I think many people think it is. And the reason is that there's nothing, it depends on who the single payer is and what their objectives are. Um, so <coughs> Medicare is a single payer system. In many, wa many ways, Medicare is excellent, but it has many of the same problems that we've identified here. Medicare is hardly exempt from the kinds of overuse and in some cases underuse uh, that, that we've been talking about. Um, so I think really we need to pivot sort of back, you know, away from this idea of a single payer. Whatever system we have, we need to be focused on this, the issues of these conversations, having conversations that have social legitimacy over what care we want to provide, to whom we want to provide it, and how we want that care provided. Thank you for that. I um, want to make note that a couple of people asked, and you had it in your presentation, uh, about the Rawls original position, if you could ex please explain it and, and how that fits into this conversation. Well, Rawls was interested in questions of justice and, and how you uh, reach some sort of a, um, a collective decision uh, about the rules of the road in society, whatever it may be. Um, and, and how do you ensure that there's some level of uh, justice or fairness um, from those rules of the road? And so he said that what you could do is um, hide behind what he calls a veil of ignorance, which means that you are making these decisions, but you don't know where you're going to end up in society. So take a very simple case like the tax rate. Okay, the tax rate has to be, we all have to agree on what the tax rate is. We can't each have our own individual tax rate. Um, and the tax rate may be different from different by different incomes. Now, some politicians would like us to see if uh, you know have a flat tax. So Rawls would appro approach this by saying, let's all have a conversation. And this is what I mean by a structured conversation. It would be structured in the sense that we, hypothetically, we don't know where we're going to end up in the income distribution. And then let's try to agree on what an appropriate tax uh, rate would be for different levels of income 
knowing that I could be at the bottom of that distribution or I could be at the top of that distribution. So the original position is this hypothetical counterfactual in which we don't know where we're going to end up. Now, of course, it's very difficult to reach the original position in real life because we all do have our own identities. Um, so I think it's a very useful concept uh, theoretically. I think it's very good at clarifying ideas. Um, but I do think that um, we also need to supplement it with some kind of an interactive social process by which we talk about you know, where we want, for example, tax rates to be. But it has to be a structured process. The sort of free-for-all that exists in our democratic system isn't really working. It's not structured enough. Uh, so, that's, so I think it's a, it's a helpful concept, but I don't think it gets us all the way there. The only, thing, yeah, yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that it's actually <coughs> related to the recalibration of uh, the focus on individual choice versus community good. Because basically what Rawls was concerned with is that ethics shouldn't be just power brokerage among self-interested parties. That an ethical way to govern the polity is to try to remove that self-interest and have people put their minds together about what's in the best interest of the group. And so his metaphor really for that was let's stand behind a veil of ignorance, not ignorance in the sense of stupidity, on the contrary, ignorance about our place in that society. Let's not know how rich or poor we're going to be. Let's not know what our personal self-interest is and if we're ignorant of our standing in that society, and if we're ignorant of our self-interests, then perhaps we can think collectively about what's fair to do. So they're really quite related to the themes of both our talks. Your talk was also related to across the lifespan. So a question that came, comes up again is that uh, we tend to focus on the elderly and childcare when creating policy. Uh, what about investing in the care of young adult and middle-aged population? Would that not reduce costs more effectively and greater benefits? So what would you say related to maybe other age groups, uh, once again, across the lifespan? Can I jump in yeah. on that? Oh, so I, I think that the, um, that's a really good question, a really good point. First, if we do a better job at the two extremes of children and the elderly, then we will be releasing middle-aged people of enormous caregiving burdens that they have right now. So these are all actually related. If we think about the highest stress on young adults, it's work-life balance. And so, you know, part of what I called for at the beginning of my talk was paid parental leave. And if you think about slightly older middle-aged people mm -hmm. in their, you know, 40s or 50s, it's the pressures on them of caring for their, for, their, for their parents, for the elders. So the two ends of the life cycle are the ones that require the most support from the working middle-aged middle. And if we create more social supports at both those ends, then we are automatically providing support to um, those in midlife. Any further comments you want to make, Dr. Zimmerman? Um, I don't know if the question was asking for any economic data. I mean, I think that it's there, there have been some studies that show that um, insurance for people, sort of healthy adults uh, in sort of midlife, um, does not save money in the longer term. Um, that's sort of the prevention point that you were making. Um, so from an economic standpoint, it might not necessarily pay off. However, uh, what, do, what insurance is really good at is um, reducing people's stress, and especially their financial stress, but also stress around, um, uh, you know, potentially more minor but still pretty meaningful health conditions. And that's why I think it's a really good idea. You mentioned earlier in terms of structured dialogue, Dr. Zimmerman, and, and, and Dr. Solomon, you have also indicated we had to talk more about it. We have to make things visible. So could you engage each other in a structured dialogue on the concept of dignity? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in part, moving in maybe from that, when you say structured dialogue or when you want more openness, what are some of the things that you either identify that's already out there, you'd say we'd like to highlight that, or is there other suggestions or thoughts from your fields that you would like to bring into the conversation? Well, I, Structured dialogue sounds yeah. really great, yeah, but, about, yeah. but yeah. what is yeah, some of the actual um, 
actions so, or um, maybe places where it's occurring that okay. you'd like to highlight? Um, well, first of all, I would love to have a conversation with Dr. Solomon uh, <laughs> about dignity because I actually think it's a really important and uh, sort of undervalued um, principle in, in healthcare and ethics. But um, I won't do that because I think, for me, a structured dialogue has to have at least two elements. One is that it, ha it has to be around a specific goal. So that's part of the structuring. It ha there has to be an objective. There has to be an agreement about what is it that we're trying to accomplish. And um, that, I think, is what's often missing in uh, debates around health and healthcare in the United States, is that there's no clarity on you know, what our goal is, what we're trying to promote. Um, so that's, I think, the first, uh, the first part of what structures a dialogue. And the second part, uh, and this is why I can't have a structured dialogue, really, with Dr. Solomon, is that it has to involve um, real, genuine representation, full participation of all of the parties who will be affected by it. And so we could talk about dignity. It would be a talk between two experts. That could be interesting, but it wouldn't qualify as, as um, structured dialogue, in my opinion, because to have a structured dialogue, we would need to know what is the context that we're talking about dignity in. You know, the, um, it's a very big principle and it could be applied in many different situations. So we'd need to know what are we trying to achieve? How we, you know, in what sense are we promoting dignity? That would be the goal of the conversation. And then anyone whose interests would be affected should be included in some <coughs> sense in that conversation. I would say, just to add, agree with all that, I, I would add that a structured dialogue should begin by knowing it's going to end with a recommendation of some kind. Yeah. So there has to be a very concrete question. All the conversations we have at the water cooler are expressions of our views about whether we need to steward resources or not. They're often statements of exasperation. But a structured dialogue says we need to make a decision about something, and we want to explore the the evidence, we want to explore the interests of diverse stakeholders. We want, that's why it's so important what you're saying about community being in. Let's anticipate the different stakeholders who might be affected by our recommendation and bring their points of view to the room. Let's be clear about the facts. I've already mentioned that. But let's also be clear about what principles we might want to maximize, what, what's going to be most important here, um, and then comes out with a recommendation. So. Um, some of the health systems around the country that are becoming learning health systems are beginning to think about structures, ways to appropriately govern the process of studying their own care, which is fraught with ethical oversight problems. You know, we used to have a clear line between informed consent for treatment and informed consent for research. But if you become a learning health system, you are collecting data about the treatment in order to study it to improve the treatment. So the boundaries between treatment and research are now blurred. And the question is, how do we provide ethical oversight for this in a way that makes sense? So some examples would be structured committees that do structured dialogue around a number of uncertain questions, like which things should we study first? Where do, where do we have, where does our community have the greatest healthcare disparities? Let, are we going to pick that as our topic? Or is there some other topic, child health or something? How, even just deciding what we're going to study about ourselves is an allocation decision. And that, that can be done. And increasingly, systems are developing committees that are comprised of patient reps, patient advocates, community, and the research and clinical teams in their systems to have real structured dialogues with very specific questions of what they want to answer. Following up on that, would you also think that these uh, structured dialogues would uh, also understand differences in geography in terms of regional differences, even sense of uh, cultural differences? It has to be community-based. Yeah, it has to represent the community. All right. The other way geography comes in, if I may, sure. I'll just add on top of that, there's some very interesting use of geography tools to, to answer the question of where should our first focus be on improving care um, by using geographic tools to create maps that show very vis visibly <coughs> where there are health disparities in a given population. And 
integrating geographers, literally, in some of these structured dialogues to help bring evidence about disparities to the table. Question from um, a student. As a future physician, how would you encourage this person to continue to tailor a cost-effective care plan for individual patients when they don't have the cost-effective research available to them? I don't want to, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, but I, sure. I don't want to. Sure, go ahead. So I don't, I personally d don't think that this should become the obligation of individual patients in an in individual encounter with a I mean, individual doctors in an individual encounter with a patient. I think that puts the physician in a really difficult spot and undermines the expectations patients come to in the doctor-patient relationship. What I would say to this student, wherever you are out there, is to wear two hats. You wear your hat in your patient relationships and your other hat is your social hat where you can help work with others in your system to develop guidelines. Once those guidelines exist, then they should guide, but never completely dictate the decisions that you make with your patient. But I wouldn't want people to leave our talks tonight thinking that you're, that we're, at least, I certainly am not arguing that the kind of structure, <coughs> the kinds of mindfulness that we should be c cultivating translates into doctors making bedside rationing decisions. That's not at all what I'm arguing. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to once again merge a couple of questions. So we'll start with the, the more dramatic one. Will it take a com collapse or a near collapse of our healthcare process in this country to see us ever begin to begin with the deal, of, deal with the problems of resource allocation? Um, so total collapse versus what would you encourage individuals to do who hear of this and what conversations they might then start in their areas of influence, where would they begin? Well, I think that, um, I think this is a social process. So I think that the starting point for individuals has to be, uh, don't be an individual. I, I mean, I think it's very important to come together in groups, to form communities, to form, uh, even if it's small groups of advocates uh, who can, um, lobby for some kind of change, whatever that is, that moves us in this kind of direction. So I, I think one of the problems that I see and that I believe I took away f also from Dr. Solomon's talk is a sort of hyperemphasis on the individual uh, in American culture. Um, I think that uh, that's perfectly great for certain kinds of things, uh, but when you're talking about decisions that ultimately truly are collective decisions, um, as I said, you know, we can only have one speed limit. So we have to get together and decide what that speed limit is going to be. We can only have one set of zoning laws in our cities. You know, these are things that we have to decide collectively, and there's a very great deal um, of rules in, uh, in the medical system that are driving the kinds of allocations that we're seeing. And the only way to change that is through some kind of collective action. So I think that it would be... Uh, I think as an individual, you have to start by recognizing the importance of collective action and beginning on a path to engage in that. And, and may I add another uh, a form of collective action would be to begin with your own professional societies. So we see this movement called Choosing Wisely, which is um, an effort on the part of many, many specialty societies mostly medical, but there's no reason why nursing and physician's assistants and other healthcare professionals can't do the same, where within their society they got together and they looked at what's the evidence about what works and doesn't work, what, what are we learning about what's actually being used, and discovering that lots of things that did, had no evidence were in wide use, and coming together to make consensus guidelines relevant to their own, own specialty. And so that's not a national system, but it's at least what you can do in your own backyard, so to speak, to begin to feel that you're make, you know, making a social effort to make change. Maybe somewhat related, but um, how can healthcare providers best encourage or influence patients to care about their health in a society that supports instant gratification, quick fixes, and this high individualism that you spoke about? there's evidence that 
that the most effective way to get people to quit smoking is to hear their doctors tell them. A lot of physicians don't realize they have that level of influence, mm -hmm. but that's like the number one most effective thing. And the same with the reluctance to vaccinate children. There's been a recent study that shows that as long as we take a kind of neutral stance and act like, well, it's all only up to you, that people resist vaccination. But when their clinician actually took a stand and said, this is very important and I really want you to consider this, I'm listening to you and engage and try to hear all that, but still, at the end of the day, take a stand. That has been more influential than people realize. Power of uh, three out of four authority. doctors. Authority. Authority. Let's use authority <laughs> when all else fails. Yeah, uh, there were a number of questions in this category, but uh, spoke about how can we best move forward as a society in caring for a rapidly growing aging population in our country? Uh, what are the uh, ways that you maybe have seen or heard related to the options available and the conversations that have been stimulated. Well, you've, happy to talk you've done work on yeah, the theory. Yeah. So this is a huge question, and I hope that it will be, I think it has already been a topic for DeVos, but it would be, it's so big it can be revisited. Um, so just to be brief, you know, we, a we have acted as though the elderly are a unitary population, but in fact there are very healthy, robust people who are in that age group who need probably what Medicare has to offer and maybe some extensions like hearing aids and things like that that aren't covered. And then there are the very, very sick um, who are in the final phase of life with a terminal illness who need probably to be referred to hospice much earlier than they currently are. And then in the middle, we have millions of people with um, chronic illness who need m lots of support to manage their chronic illness over a long period of time of increasing frailty in their homes. And we really need to create a way to fund the, the social supports, the transportation needs they have, the logistical needs that people have to help those people managing chronic illness for long periods of time at home. <coughs> And right now, we have nothing in that, in that band. Very little, let me say. I don't want to say nothing. But we have much, much less in that band. So if we could start to think about the demographics of the elderly in these three different categories, I want to credit Muriel Gillick, who's written on this and has advocated thinking about this in that way. Um, I forget the name of her book, but if you look up Gillick, G-I-L-L-I-C-K, and one of the models that she's recommended for this middle group is the PACE model, which is um, the Program for All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly, which is a wonderful model with lots of research that shows it actually works. It keeps people at home self-sufficient longer, keeps people out of the hospital, very low hospital, hospital utilization, <coughs> saves money. It's one of those examples I should have used in my talk of you know, a wiser allocation of resources. But so far, PACE has only been done on a rather small scale. And what um, Dr. Gillick advocates is a way to bring it to scale across the country. Yeah, so I think I, I would agree with all of that. And, and um, I, I think the other part is that w you know, when we talk about um, the patient-centeredness that, that you were talking about in your talk, I think it's very interesting to expand the <laughs> sphere of choices that we're looking at. So in other words, it isn't just about um, telling, the, telling the patient, you know, do you want this cancer drug or do you want that cancer drug? That there has to be more of an emphasis on what do older people who are in an insurance system, the covered lives, so to speak, you know, what, what is it that they want? You know, what is their definition of health? And how can the system best promote and foster the, you know, their attainment of their own definition of health? And I think these kinds of things really help us get there. But it also means changing what you know, changes in conception of patient-centeredness, which shouldn't just be about choosing treatments in the hospital. It should be, let's really ask them what their, their values are and how can we meet their needs as they understand them before they even get to the hospital. I'll make this the last question from this uh, table of questions and then turn to the you once again for direct questions to Dr. Solomon or Dr. Zimmerman. 
Um, a question related to the driving, the, the, the increased costs for medical, uh, the increased costs for medical uh, procedures and the like. A question that was somewhat related here is what are the principal reasons for these driving costs of health care? And in part, the question also asked, what's the role of administration in that? Mm. And the question also I was wondering if administration is a part of the problem rather than solution. Uh -huh. So is there any love for administrators here? <laughs> well. I don't think they need administrators. I think they need insurance companies. Um, I don't know. Um, I hope so. Let's see. Can I, can I take an hour to answer this question? <laughs> or do you want the long talk? Ah, uh, that's right. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, um, so I guess I would just very briefly divide it into two different um, components. One is that the United that costs are rising in the United States, um, as they are in all countries, and you saw from that graph. Uh, we're not the only country that is concerned about the increase in its uh, medical spending. Of course, that's driven partly by demography. It's also driven partly by um, increased uh, morbidity in the population. Um, but it's very largely driven by uh, improvements in medical technology. So there are certainly some economists who say the increase in cost is actually making us better off because we're paying for technologies that are better at improving our health. So there's that side of it. The other side of it, though, is the difference in the United States to other countries. And I think what's driving that, I mean, there was you know, a lot of that stuff on there, which is inefficiency in the delivery of care, delivering redundant services, uh, prices that are too high, and so forth. Um, so, and I think that um, hospital administrators and even in increasingly insurance companies are aware of those as problems and they are actively working to try to fix them. But it's, 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 part of the problem is that the medical administrators don't always have the power. Uh, sometimes it's physicians who have the power. And they may be reluctant to go along with what the administrators say, especially if they feel like it's getting in the way of their patient provider relationship. So it's a very complicated thing. It's another one of those areas that we need all stakeholders at the table to try to talk about what's going to be the solution here. Speaking of all stakeholders, do you have something more? I saw you move. Okay, all right, then we're going to turn to the to those gathered here. So once again, if you have a, just raise your hand. You want, someone will bring a mic to you so we can record this. Uh, one at the very top. And if you could identify yourself by name as well, that would be helpful. And we appreciate, once again, um, getting as many questions as possible, depending on, uh, once again, brevity of the question. Uh, my name is Kevin McDonald, and I'd like to address this question to our moderator. Uh, did Jesus die with dignity? And really, to put a slightly more pointed weight to it, what are you doing at Calvin Seminary to talk about dignity and its relationship to medical care and what a good Calvinist should do or not do with regard to medical care. Yeah. I will actually uh, take the question as one in which we have a, and I wish I had it right in front of me, right, right in front of me. Dr. Lortz, who is from St. Louis, is gonna be doing an online elective for us. Uh, he's a physician and he's wanting to once again help train our pastors about how to deal with these conversations about especially end of life issues and what does it mean to uh, in terms of helping people understand those issues. So thanks for the free plug and I'll give you that later. Down here. If you want to raise your hand up for, for the getting it next, that would help us. I'm Steve Margulis, a retiree from Grand Valley State University. Uh, it's my understanding that Michigan, this state, collects uh, hospital either cost or charges. I'm not too sure which it is, data from hospitals, but it's prohibited from making it public. So um, if that, is that, does anyone know whether that, in fact, is a true statement? Yeah, but that's what I've heard. So the kind of information that could help us make decisions simply isn't available to us, or it's available to somebody, but I know who it's not available to, the people sitting here. A second issue that comes up with, is with regard to uh, the effectiveness of treatment questions is that I used to teach issues about criteria used in evaluating services, and one of the problems you get in that field is there's never any agreement on, on criteria. So what one person says makes good service, another person says, no, I don't do that, I do this. And if you can't get agreements on the criteria, you'll never know which hospital is going to do you well or do you poorly. 
So on two areas where you have to make intelligent decisions, you're not gonna get a good answer, or an answer that's gonna help you reduce confusion. And, and, and I'm just mentioning that seems to be the reality of the situation. I, I, unless there's a better answer, I, I don't know if it's out there. I'm also concerned, if I understand physicians in my family, that physicians are turning into a factory. They're getting people in and out in 10, maybe 20 minutes tops. Where the hell this conversation takes place that you're talking about is a mystery to me. They don't have the time, and they might not have the expertise. OK, um, great. So those are all really interesting points. Um, the, about half the states, I don't know the exact number, but it's roughly half the states um, have price transparency laws, and the other half don't. And so I gather Michigan is one of the states that doesn't have that law. Um, and you're exactly right. They, they're under no obligation to report um, you know, the prices of their services or how much they re were reimbursed. Um, we recently tried to get a law like that passed in California, and it narrowly failed. I think it's a really good idea. Um, the, the New York Times and others have done um, studies of price differentials, and they find prices differ by an order of magnitude, by 10 times or more um, for the same service. And that's when you can even find out the price. So this is a, it's an amazing thing, and that's, it's one of the things that makes healthcare just not a market. I mean, what other market would you say, okay, you got to buy something, but you, we're not going to tell you how much it costs, you know, until three weeks later, if at all. So yes, that's a huge problem. Quality is, is very difficult to assess. Um, uh, there are some ways of doing it, and I think that's, that is evolving science. And the whole idea of measuring quality and then reporting it to the public is extremely difficult, but that's not something that our field is, I think, working on. Um, and yeah, the conversation, um, there's not enough time uh, in, in, in the uh, clinical visit, uh, uh, and especially in primary care. That's something that I think needs to be addressed. I think that's one of the issues that we should be talking about. And um, it's not, the time isn't there in part because primary care services are not reimbursed at the rates that specialty care is. And so the primary care providers just don't, they don't have the time because they need the volume is sort of the short version of that problem. But it's a, that is what we need to have the conversation about. So I think we need to get um, you know, providers and patients and others in a room to talk about differences in reimbursement rates across different kinds of physician specialties. Right here. So I know this is, oh, oh my name is Jason Dyka. I'm a public health student here. Um, I know this is a topic that is uh, very relevant in organ uh, transplant uh, allocation, but when we're talking about monetary uh, resource allocation, um, six months or a year of life extension might be more societally valued for my 54-year-old um, father-in-law who just passed away of brain cancer, more so than my 90-year-old grandmother, right, where the cost of extending those lives might be the same um, for either individual. So how do we as a society uh, come to terms with uh, those sorts of decisions, um, and, uh, and how do we make those decisions uh, w without really succumbing to ageism and, and valuing um, you know, younger lives over older lives or having that debate? Or on the flip side, how do we start talking more about death and start to um, really engage that conversation in our society so that we become more comfortable with death at old age so maybe we don't see the need to spend so much money to extend life and, um, and may be able to, you know, allocate those resources to other, other things, so. Yeah. So, it's Jason? Yeah, so Jason brought up a lot of important points and you invoked a well-known statistic that a great deal of Medicare costs occur in the last six months of life. So uh, that gives me an opportunity to be on a soap opera that, a soap box, a soap box. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a soap opera too, but we'll stick to a soap box. Um, it has never concerned me that we spend, even though my area of scholarship has focused on end of life care, it has never concerned me that we spend more money in the last six months of life because it's only sensible that that is where people's greatest health care needs would be when they are sickest and our prognostic skills are not that good that we know that this is the last six months. So I've never been terribly persuaded by that statistic, even though it's touted quite a bit. But I do know that we can save money in 
even as we improve end-of-life care for people in the final period of their lives. It's one of those really rare circumstances where doing the higher quality thing also tends to be less expensive. Um, and there have been some very interesting studies, particularly in cancer care, that show that that's the case, that you get better measures of quality of life, you get better me measures of family satisfaction, there's that term, um, in circumstances where there's been excellent palliative care to people near the end of life, and there have been cost savings too. So I think these happen to come together in a very unusual way, and the more that we enhance palliative care, build palliative care services, refer and use palliative care, we will see increases in quality and reductions in cost. As far as your question about two different ages, um, I think it that you know commodity scarcity, which is what organ transplantation is, and fiscal scarcity, which is what we're talking about with health care costs, are quite different, as you yourself pointed out. And I don't think we have to make that ageist stance. I, I think that if we change our ways of relating to patients to ask them about their own goals, goals of care and their family's understanding of what their is in their best interest that they can't speak for themselves, again, studies have shown that most, many, many families, this isn't true for all, there are all, always demanding families who, who may choose unwisely and we give them the right to do that, but many, many families do choose not to impose excessive technologies on their loved ones. And I don't think we need to distinguish this by age. I don't think our, I would not support uh, age-based policies on this. I think we need to just do a better job of being proactively discussing with people what their, all their options are, as Dr. Zimmerman said, including what life might be like after you leave the hospital. Do you want to go to the nursing home or would you prefer that you know that the ventilator be withdrawn. Do you think your loved which choice would your loved one have really wanted? We rarely ask that while the patient is still in the hospital. Okay. Sure. All right. We'll start with the, you have the mic already, so we'll go with you and then we'll go here. Thanks. Hi, Julie Bolson. I'm the director of emergency preparedness, and um, my question actually is really around the structured dialogue that you had talked about earlier. I've been involved in um, conversations and the development of scarce resource allocations during disaster situations and how do we determine who gets those resources in a crisis. Um, you talked about the need to have those structured dialogues with the stakeholders of the outcomes um, we've tried to do that, but have not been very successful. And so I'm really looking for some of maybe your success stories and some of the ideas that you have where you can gather appropriate stakeholders uh, across all you know, economic levels and educational levels and really get their input <coughs> on a plan or um, the conversation that you want to have related to those decisions that need to be made. Well, um, I would uh, so I would offer some examples from outside of healthcare. Um, one of, one of them that I'm particularly fond of is the California Citizens Redistricting Commission, which is a kind of unwieldy name. But you know, redistricting is a political matter, um, and it's usually uh, favors the incumbent party in the state legislature, and they draw district lines for elections that are going to favor them to get reelected. And then, as a secondary concern. They draw the line so that incumbents in the other party are also reelected. Uh, California, I guess it was about four years ago, decided that it was fed up with that, and they passed a citizens initiative that never would have gotten through the legislature to have a committee of citizens draw the congressional districts for both the state and the federal elections in California. And the way they set it up was that they were going to get uh, six members from who were Democrats, six independents, and six Republicans. And they invited everyone to sign up. And then they randomly chose people you know, to fit into those categories. So in that sense, it's representative. They had a specific goal, which was to you know, draw the district lines. And they succeeded in drawing excellent lines. Shortly after they came out, there were Republicans in the state who criticized it, the Republican Party. And it was the Republican members of the Citizens Redistricting Commission 
who stuck up for it. And they said, no, we are the Republicans on this. We understand the process. We did it as best we could. It doesn't favor Republicans, but California doesn't favor Republicans in general, so that's tough. You know, and the other thing that happened was two sitting Democratic rep U.S. representatives were redistricted into the same district. And they fought it out. In fact, they had a debate, and they literally were punching each other on stage. <laughs> this would never happen in a politically oriented dis redistricting. Uh, so it's, that's the kind of thing where um, you're really getting people to talk to each other in a meaningful way, sit down, and people who disagree vehemently can actually reach some uh, consensus when they have uh, you know, a concrete goal that they need to achieve and a policy outcome. The other thing I would just say is that the people who are associated with this process said that it's not enough to just like put up a sign. You have to reach out to people. You have to tell them, sign up for this. So there's a ton of outreach going to people where they are, you know, supermarkets, the DMV, all kinds of places, and actively telling them, please sign up for this. They got a huge number of volunteers, which is good. But that process of reaching out to people and encouraging them to sign up, even if those people weren't chosen, it adds to the legitimacy of the whole process. Examples I would add, um, right here in Michigan, I'm just, I'm not sure whether he's at Michigan State or you know, where, exactly where he is, but Len Fleck, who is a bioethicist, has done a wonderful job around resource allocation and stewardship of developing case examples and bringing them to very structured public meetings to get the views of Michigan citizens. So right in your own state, you have a real expert in how to do this. He's a terrific, terrific um, thinker. Um, a little bit further from home, we mentioned the National Institute for Clinical Effectiveness in the UK. And they are an interesting example of a lot of, ex a lot of experts, um, a lot of economists and statisticians who are working inside of NICE to develop cost effectiveness data, but they've made a very conscious effort to um, develop community advisory groups that um, discuss what the evidence is that the experts can bring is never enough, and so there's community dialogue about that before they issue their guidelines. So I think there's a lot of models. There's also community-based participatory research, which is engaging the community in setting what research questions are, in choosing what outcomes matter to the community, and in making sure that the findings of the research come back to benefit the communities where people um, volunteered to participate in the study. So there's, there's, there's emerging models that we could draw on from various sectors. We have one more question, and then I'll make some closing comments. So my name is Jessica. I'm a first year medical student at Michigan State. And um, I, my classmates and I have received numerous emails and propagandists you know, talking about the physician shortage that's coming up and, or that's growing over the next few years. So I just want to know if, if it's going to have any effect on the current healthcare market, if it's going to worsen um, the cost care effectiveness or if it's going to do anything at all. Uh, yeah, the physician workforce is a tremendously important issue, and it's it's been a, it's been an issue since the 20s, I think. Um, uh, and uh, there I there is a shortage, particularly of primary care physicians. It's partly driven uh, by a lack, a deliberate lack of spaces in medical schools. It's partly driven by um, the um, uh, by the system of compensation that so you know richly rewards specialty physicians. So I think the lack is more there for um, primary care than for the specialties. Um, and you know, I think it is gonna change. I think that there could be some credentialing issues. So certain things that are now done by physicians could be done by nurse practitioners. Um, certifying work, worker comp claims is one example that's been tried in some different states. Um, you know, and there are other things. I mentioned the case of anesthesiologists versus ner registered nurse anesthetists. So I think that that all of that is, is up for grabs. But I also think it's, it's gonna change with the policy environment. I think a lot of those, especially the credentializing things, and uh, you know, that is driven primarily by policy changes. And so look for policy to be a really important area of healthcare into the future. Of course, it has been in the past as well, but it's gonna be an important issue. Well, I, uh, once again, are grateful for your uh, being here as well. 
Um, we're going to thank our sp speakers in just a moment. I was asked to make a couple of brief announcements. The 23rd colloquy in the series will take place in March of 2016. The topic is, is America going to pot? <laughs> Special speakers from Colorado, Oregon, and you can... You know. <laughs> now, in your packet, there is this note. Dear friends, in order to cut down administrative costs, we will be issuing invitations in electronic formats only. So if you want to get it an invitation to that or anything else in the future, you need to fill that in and appreciate you doing that. We also want you to, once again, fill in your evaluation form so we can continue to grow and develop. And we want to thank again the Richard and Helen DeVos Foundation, Grand Valley State University. Uh, and let's once again close our evening by giving thanks to Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Solomon.